All right, uh, good morning. Yeah, thank you very much for attending. It's my very, very first in-person conference for almost three years. The last in-person one, I think, was the uniform annual conference in 2019 in Seattle, if I remember correctly. All right, so I'm very, very excited about this. Um, a special thanks to Andrew uh, Rowling and uh, Jason for lots of Lots of very, uh, uh, lots of work to put things together to have a very, very nice workshop like this. Uh, we have folks over here in person. We also have folks online. Uh, and um, Andrew told me, you know, this is our very first uh, presentation for the workshop. And probably it's a good idea to give an overview about revenue management, choice models, applications in, uh, you know, in, in, especially in hotel business. So I, I try my best to do the job. And uh, so the presentation has two parts. First part is about the overview for the, uh, for the field. The second part is about a new thing we have been working uh, for quite a while uh, with Ovush uh, from here, uh, Zifun from Norden, and Andrew and Jose from Oracle. All right, so uh, here is about discrete choice models and applications. We talk about the modeling, estimation, and applications. Uh, all right, let's start with some examples. Uh, suppose we want to book a hotel room and we always have lots and lots of options and from different channels, all right? So the, the decision for us we are going to make is which one are we going to choose. So it's a, it's a choice behavior for, for us, for guests, for customers, for people like us. Uh, what are we going to do? You know, we, we, are, we are rational, we are smart people, and we have multiple options. We are going to uh, consider them, we are going to choose the best, right? So let's, uh, let's talk about how we can make choices. Uh, customer choice decision. Uh, when we are facing with the multiple choices, and which does the customer choose? So you know, here is an example about the hotel rooms and many many other examples, the services and the products. So um, and we um, we care lots of things, and uh, probably the first thing coming into our mind maybe the price. So we are price sensitive. And uh, there are lots and lots of data. We can estimate the price sensitivity. We can calibrate the price elasticity. Uh, elasticity. For example, the price is higher, and, and the demand will decrease. So we can also say a lot more, for example, how much will decrease, right? So and there are other things. For example, you know, the hotel rooms, and there are multiple hotels uh, in the same area. And even for the same hotel, we have different options at a different prices, with the different services, with different add-ons, which one are we going to choose? Here, you know, see here is the but the, 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 they, they, they are compete against each other, they are substitutable. So in the same category. So that's the first thing we want to consider, the price elasticity and the substitution. There are other things, for example, uh, the cross-category product. Uh, it's more than substitution. They may be complementary. They help each other. They make each other more attractive to customers. Uh, for example, when you buy a suit, you may consider shirts. Uh, you know, the shirts may have different values when they come with the different suits. So it's about the fitting, it's about the style, it's about the taste. Right? So the, the cross category product, their relationship is different from substitution. Uh, here we consider the complementarity. All right, so like the hotel rooms and the breakfast, the eight ounce, the upgrades, so they are complementary. So if we only consider substitution, we miss something that can be very important in customers' decision making. Uh, all right, so that's the customers. For, for firms, for service pro providers, um, the first decision is the pricing. The pricing could be static, could be dynamic, could be very dynamic. Um, uh, like the peak price and off peak price, uh, just a change a little bit, you know, by different season. Um, they can be very dynamic, it depends on the state, depends on the time to go, depends on the inventory availability. Also depends on what our competitors are doing. If they are going to do promotion, probably we are going to do the same, right? So it depends on the market condition. And uh, here I want to bring the idea, a assignment to your, to, your, to your attention. Uh, what, what, what is the assignment? Uh, I think we have been doing this for, for, for quite a while. Um, from the, you know, in the literature from academic, uh, we have the special term uh, assignment. What, what is the assignment? Basically, assignment is 
uh, what are you going to present to your customers? You have many products. Um, in some scenario, you don't have lots of space. The capacity can be limited. You got to choose a subset of your product to present to your customers. And, 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 and a assignment could be different for different customers, could be personalized, and could be different at different time, depending on the market condition. Right? So you know, literally, we call it assignment. Um, all right, so I think we get a sense. It's not always a good idea to present everything to your customers, uh, especially about the promotion. When we get an email about a promotion, you don't want to see too many different things. You want to see a few, they're very good, you really, really like them, right? So it's, 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 it's more effective. Um, all right, so another thing is more than assignment. Uh, here we call it a position effect. It depends on where you present your product. Think about a brick and mortar store. You go there, you see many different products. Think about the shelf location. You know, the shelf location at the eye level is different from the bottom, from the top. All right, so the shelf location, the, the position effect take, can, can play a very important role in customer uh, choice behavior. Uh, for the online setting, it can be different too. For example, the product on the first page uh, can be different than the product on the second page, on the third page. On, you know, I think in most cases, no one go beyond five pages. So the position effect is very, very important. Uh, even though you decide you want to show this product to your customer, how are you going to show this product to your, product, uh, to, to your customer can be very important. Right? So here is the position effect is more than assignment. Assignment is just a subset of, of the available product you want to show to your customer. You want to get into detail how and where are you going to present the product to your customer is another important decision. Um, all right, so upsell. Yeah, we like upsell. We want to sell more products. Uh, more valuable product to our customers. Um, all right, so the upsell plays a very important role in pricing, in assignment, especially for uh, the hotel business. Uh, it's about the upsell, cross-sell, or add-on services. And uh, I think for the hotel business, uh, there is a time between customers reserve a hotel room and actual check-in. That is the period of time you can have interactions with our customers. Uh, you can do promotion, you can offer upgrade options to your customers. All right, so uh, you, you want your customer purchase more product, a more valuable product, and have very good experience with the, uh, with the hotel. Right, so, all right. Two questions, what do you mean by cross-sale? Uh, cross-sale is by the cross-category. Uh, uh, um, Can I say that again? Oh, okay. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, cross sale is about the cross category sales. So uh, it's more than just the, the single the product category. All right. So uh, think about the, the main product category and the secondary product category. So you want a customer to purchase the main product together with the secondary product, complementary product. All right. Um, so we consider modeling, we consider estimation, we consider optimization. Um, all right, so a little bit more about the models. And we consider the utility model. Uh, we assume customers are rational, so um, and they want to purchase the product they like the most. Uh, in terms of utility, you know, each product has a utility to the customer. They want to choose the product with the highest utility. Uh, basically, this assumption about the customer rationality. And sometimes you can argue, you know, the, the utility is kind of the willingness to pay. They want to pay this much at the most for this product or for this service. That's the utility function. Uh, there's lots, lots of rich theory about the utility models, uh, especially for the random utility maximization. In the utility could be random. Uh, uh, for, for, for different customers, especially when we consider a larger population. Uh, you randomly choose a customer, the utility for that customer could be different, right? Uh, that's the perspective from the, the, the outside observer, from the firm's perspective. But for that individual customer, probably she knows her utility, right? But that's a different story. Um, all right, so uh, customers are rational, 
customer will choose a product I if the product I's utility is greater than any product J's utility. Basically, that's an assumption for the random utility maximization. We are going to choose a product I if product I is better than any other product. That's a very basic assumption. Um, all right, so um, utility depends on, depends on many things. Uh, utility could be a function of product attributes, if the product can be break down to the attribute level. Uh, think about a, a PC, a computer. A computer, the utility is the function of the computer attributes, like the brand, the RAM, the CPU, the screen, and, and, and the warranty, and some other attributes. Right, so if we can estimate the utility for each attribute, put them together, we can have a sense about the utility for that product. So uh, if the utility can be broken down and to the attribute level, we can do this. All right, we can do the same thing for add-ons, for upgrade, for services, for some services. Uh, for example, uh, the flight ticket uh, is a function of the seat, uh, uh, actual leg room, our free check-in bags and other attributes. If we know this, we can uh, uh, estimate the value for that product or for that service, right? But for other product, for other services, we cannot break down to attribute level, so, um, but probably because we don't know much. But in practice, if we have data, we can still estimate the, the utility. Uh, for example, we may have multiple interactions with uh, customers at a different prices. So we can estimate their willingness to pay. Uh, or we may only have one interaction, but we can consider multiple customers. So put them together, study a group, and we can have better understanding about the, the utility for that product or that service. All right, so that's the, that's the, that's the utility. And a little bit more. Uh, we assume customers are rational. They are going to choose the one with the highest utility. Um, but in practice, in reality, probably we are not fully rational. Uh, we are boundedly rational. So uh, it depends. It could be the case. Um, uh, for example, you will spend lots and lots of time with their product. You can understand better about their product. You can decide buy or not to buy. And, but sometimes we don't have that much time. And uh, you only spend um, you know, limited time with the product. You have more or less basic, basic understanding. You don't want to fully resolve the utility uncertainty. And here we assume you know, customers are bounded, rational, depending on the scenarios. All right, so there are lots lots of theories about the behavior, like the prospect theory, uh, a reference price. Uh, for this product, I have a reference price. I have a reservation value for that product. So if the price the, is, is lower than my reservation, I'm going to buy, otherwise I don't. So simple like this, with a threshold structure. Actually, in practice, in theory, it works pretty well. So a threshold policy is a very, very good policy. It's not optimal, but it's very good heuristic. And it's tractable in terms of estimation and optimization. All right, there are lots and lots of literature. Here is just one example. Um, threshold effect, uh, the one I just, just said. And another concept is consideration set. Consideration set is different from product offer set. Uh, you want to buy a computer, you want to buy a car. There are so many on the market. They are the product offer sets. If you want to buy, you can buy any of them. But not all of them are in your consideration. Here's the idea, consideration set, you are really, really interested in them. So you, 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 you want to uh, study the feature of each product in the consideration set, and eventually you are going to buy one of them. So the consideration set is the subset of the product offset. So here's the idea is, how do we form our consideration set? The answer is, it depends. <laughs> it's always like this. So it depends, depends on who we are, depends on how we behave. Um, um, uh, for example, um, you may have budget constraints. I want to buy, uh, buy a car. My budget is you know, 25K and 35K, so I only consider the cars in this price range. That's my consideration set. Oh, I'm interested in a very special feature, so I only consider the product with that feature. 
there are many other different ways to form a, a consideration set. Um, so if the firms are aware of that, so they can um, um, uh, change their uh, strategy uh, accordingly. Depends on you know they, they can do a lot. They can do promotions. They can do pricing. They can change their product opposite. Um, all right. So um, threshold effect. Uh, threshold can be used to form a consideration set. Um, all right. So another idea is that it's a such a cost. Um, you know, it'll take time for us to make a decision. Uh, most of the time we are spending in the decision making is about we want to learn product feature values. We want to resolve the utility uncertainties. We understand better about each product in our consideration set and we can make a better decision to buy or not to buy, right? So uh, searching is, uh, is costly, is time consuming. So here we call it that is such a cost. Uh, so that's why we don't search too many. If you search too many, it takes a very, very long time to do that. And, and we don't search too few user. If you only consider very few, it's likely you don't like find the product you like the most. So, so here is the you know, consideration set. Also, place role here is the trade-off between search cost and a product match. All right? So another decision, uh, and, you know, another strategy is, uh, uh, is a sequential search versus a simultaneous search. Uh, are you going to uh, consider all the product in the consideration set simultaneously together, or you are going to search one at, at a time, depending on uh, uh, the realization of the product utility, you can decide when you are going to stop and make a purchase. So that's, that's, a, that's a huge difference between the two sets of policies, sequential and simultaneous. Such a cost also plays a role here. All right. Um, and now is the time for data. So data-driven decision making is, uh, is very important, is very useful uh, in practice. So we consider modeling, we can consider optimization. Uh, here is the example about the data-driven ticket pricing. Um, for multiple sales channels and uh, with uh, heterogeneous customers. You know, customers are very different in many, many different ways, and there are different channels for customers to purchase any product, right? So here is the joint project. Uh, our friend Aruch was a main driver for this project. Uh, he did an awesome job for this one. Um, here is about the customer heterogeneity in, in, the, uh, uh, in the decision making we are going to consider. Uh, when we estimate the choice models, we have to consider the customer heterogeneity. Uh, you know, customer very different in many different ways. And for decision making for firm, when they decide product prices and product opposite, they have to take into account the customer heterogeneity. Right? So uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, lastly, about the project we have been working on, um, and here we propose a new choice model. Uh, we call it a copula best choice model. Um, you know, there are many, many discrete choice models. Uh, we really, really love them. They're good, they're, they're, they're tractable, and, but there are still lots of limitations for the existing choice models. For example, the logical choice model, multinomial logical choice model, nested logical choice model, a paired choice model, the logical choice model family, and other discrete choice models. Um, uh, these discrete choice models, uh, we assume a customer choose one, exactly one, or at most one. And, but in practice, uh, we may choose more than one. Think about the retailing, think about the grocery, you purchase more than one product. Even for the product in the same category, you may purchase multiple products, you may purchase multiple units of the same product, right? So uh, when we consider different product categories, uh, it's even more complicated. So the single purchase is, uh, uh, the assumption is too restricted. And uh, in many discrete choice models, we assume the product utilities are independent. Uh, in practice, there may be correlation, especially the products that share the same feature. Uh, for example, think about two, CP, two computers with the same CPU, very good ones. So their utility should be positively correlated, right? 
And uh, even we consider the random usage maximization framework with the, the wrong model. So the independent assumption is um, probably is the wrong here. So that's why we consider the uh, copy light choice model. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's much more flexible than the existing discrete choice models. Uh, actually, the MNL, the logical choice model, is a special case of this one. Um, here, we like this idea because here we only need the, um, the marginal utility. Uh, think about the multiple product. Think about the joint distribution for the random utilities. It can be very, very complicated, right? But here in the copula idea, what we need is, uh, uh, is the marginal utility and the matrix for the, for the, for the copula. Actually, the copula is a, is a well-established model in statistics. We want to use it to model the customer choice behavior, uh, in the, um, in the, especially in the retaining setting. Right, so the model is more com uh, flexible than the existing discrete choice models. So um, yeah, we, can, we have some applications. Uh, on this model, we can also consider the optimization, estimation optimization is a, uh, is a uh, inner to inner solution. The, the innovation, the new idea is the, the, the discrete choice, choice model, the copula choice model, different from the existing model we have been using for years. Um, all right, because of the time, I think <laughs> I got to skip this. That's the only slide that I have a mathematical formula. Uh, basically, here we consider multiple products. Uh, we consider the utilities. Uh, there could be certain correlation. We need the joint distribution. Here we use uh, uh, the copula. Uh, we consider the marginals, put them together. What we need is the marginal and the matrix, the correlation matrix. Uh, so that's why we use this idea, and we can consider uh, estimation, we can consider optimization. We can take into account all the practical constraints, like inventory, like, uh, uh, like the time. It could be the, um, 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 the stochastic dynamic programming setting, right? So basically we can do the same thing. The key idea is that the online, the choice model different. Uh, yeah, the random utility model are special case of this one. And then how do you pick like multiple products? Uh, that's a very good idea. Here, for the, just a little bit more, we consider marginal. Uh, a, and the copula choice model, we can compute a threshold. If the realized utility is greater than threshold, for each product, we are going to buy it. So that's why some customer may purchase more than one. Right? Um, all right, here we have data, special thanks to uh, the cars, uh, Wurch, Zhifeng, Anju, and OA. Uh, it's, uh, it's a data set about the chain hotel in a large US city. We consider five upgrade options, early check-in, uh, King Suite, uh, Korea View, Street View, and uh, Deluxe. Here is the basic statistics for the data. For the independent variables, we have days in advance, the length of stay, and loyalty, uh, 79, and discount amount in dollars. Uh, you can see here for this one, the copula, we consider the Gaussian copula. Uh, uh, um, copula. Uh, basically, the utility is a multivariate uh, normal distribution. You can see the, um, the correlation matrix. Clearly, we can see the correlation is, uh, is, uh, uh, is there and is positive. So if you like the upgrade, this upgrade option, you like the other upgrade option. So the, uh, the independent assumption is, uh, uh, is, uh, is not a good idea here. Uh, here we consider the Gaussian copula. Uh, um, uh, the utility are uh, correlated. Uh, and here for this one, the estimation says the correlation is positive. Yeah, but the independent model, you just need more dependence about each alternative? Uh, here we, we don't assume independence, dependence or not. We let the data tell. Uh, here the estimation says yes, they are correlated. They're not so independent. The model, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If they're independent, you only have the diagonal numbers. Okay. Right. Oh so uh, yeah, sure. So, in this application, why do you like the correlation between the utilities? Yeah, uh, because here we have five upgrade options: early check-in, King Suite, oh, yeah. view. 
they are all upgrade options. If you like one, you like the other. They are positively correlated. And we also compare this model with the independent model. The utilities are independent. We find the new model performs better. Here is the likelihood uh, in the training and in the testing, the larger the better. We also have AIC, BIC, the smaller the better. Right? And here we have the estimation results in detail. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, that's why this model is better than the logic choice model. Logic choice model, in many discrete choice model, customer choose at most one. Here on this model, customer may choose multiple options. Uh, some customer may choose early check in and a deluxe. Is it possible? So in our model, you can choose multiple options. <laughs> they can, right. they can, they can. Okay. The model is more flexible than the uh, classic discrete choice models. I think. So your benchmark, the independent model. The benchmark is. Uh, uh, I'm not clear about the benchmark. Yeah, yeah, independent model is, uh, um, is independent logistic model. Uh, customer make a decision for each option independently. Uh, and that means there are only two choices for each option. Uh, you don't select it or you select it. Um, and there is no correlation between the option utilities. Uh, customer can still choose more than one. So straightforward MNLs. Uh, yeah, we have five different MNLs. No purchase option, yeah, you got it, yeah. All right, here we have the details for the estimation about the copyright choice model. Uh, the idea we want to say, you know, it's the new model, it performs better. On this correlation basis, is any of that, on this correlation mechanical, because it seems to be, like in the hotel inventory, it tends to have larger issues, and like the model also tends to, because like, you can imagine the, the hotel has a Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's a very good insight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe make a diagram I can see like early check in, like you can do that with, with any of these, but yeah, I think that would be like the demand side story. Yeah. Right. So, so the way the product works is um, a guest can request anything they want. So they can even request. Um, both a king suite and a deluxe suite, right? But obviously, the person can't stay in two at the same time. So the hotel would decide based on inventory availability which to put them in. But they could also say you can have the deluxe suite and you can have an early check in. And some of our deluxe suites have courtyard view, so we'll give you that. So you could conceivably fulfill three out of the five. No? But that's on the assortment side. But on the customer side, when you think about customer interest, I guess the classic correlation really Probably there is the more tendency that I, I would be happy to pay money for other features. Right? Yeah. 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 Probably if you are this kind of upgrade more, you want to get. You're luxurious person. And we that the application allows the guest to take all. So we have a little button that says, "Give me everything," and then the hotel, it's up to the hotel's discretion what to actually fulfill. So if you are interested in this suite. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Just very quickly to summarize, uh, here we propose, we, 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 we go over the uh, literature about the discrete of models of getting the revenue management, especially in hotel business. Uh, we propose a new model, the copyright choice model. Uh, here, you know, our preliminary study shows it does a better job in terms of uh, uh, feeding data and describing customer choice behavior. I think this model has a lot of potential uh, in terms of, uh, you know, estimation, optimization, and the increase the revenue and the profit for the firms. Uh, all right, uh, we can talk more later offline. Thank you very much. <laughs>